Today is September 15th, 2020, and my guest is author and poet Reginald Dwayne Betts. Dwayne is the founder of the Million Book Project, a project to put a curated collection of 500 books in over 1,000 prisons in the United States. The project is supported by the Mellon Foundation and is part of Yale Law School's Justice Collaboratory. Dwayne's memoir of life in prison, A Question of Freedom, was published in 2009. His most recent poetry collection is Felon, published in 2019. I want to thank Plantronics for providing the Blackwire 5220 for today's conversation. And I want to let parents know that this episode may include conversation that is inappropriate for children. Dwayne, welcome to Econ Talk. Hey, it's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, let's talk about the Million Book Project. Uh, how did you conceive of it and what what is it? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's interesting really because when you aren't incarcerated, certain things that you can have in abundance, you don't understand what it means not to have it. And so books are really uh, the main thing that I'm referring to. And I just remember when I was in prison, I was uh, probably 17, 18, and I was in solitary confinement. Now, I was already in a prison that, that didn't have a library. But now I'm in solitary confinement, and books are literally contraband. I remember being in a hole, and we had set up a sort of underground network of book sharing. You ask for a book, and a person would send you the book. You might not know who, who they are. You might not know what sale they were in. You might have never seen their face. And it was wild because, like, <laughs> the floors, the sales were parallel. And so somebody would have to lay literally on the floor with their head to the ground to slide the book from their sale to yours. And somebody slid me this book called The Black Poets and by Dudley Randall, and it was an anthology of poetry. And I read that book, and as soon as I read the work of Etheridge Knight, I decided to become a poet. Etheridge Knight, correct? Yes, Etheridge Knight. And and the wild thing, and, and, and he – sparked my interest in poetry because he was doing what all of the other great poets were doing, but he had also served time in prison. And it just made me believe that it was possible for me to be a poet. But now you fast forward, you know, 20 some odd years and I publish a book and my book is in hardback. First of all, it's $30. Second of all, it's a print run of a few thousand. And so it's just like unlikely it'll never be in any prison in the United States. Right. And I say, well, well, what does it mean actually to have a lack of access to so much great work? And how can I encourage access and encourage books to function in, in, this, in the space of incarceration um, in the same way that books function in a space of my life as a free person, but also the lives of people I admire? And, and books are central to my life, you know? And so I conceptualized the Million Book Project as a way to say, what if we curated 500 books, which is really – you know, a decent few years of reading. I mean, theoretically, it could be 10 years if you're a slow reader. In prison, it might only be three or four years. But the point is that it's a, a decent education. And, and, and the presence of those books on a housing unit could fundamentally change how people conceptualize the time that they're doing. You know, you always recognize that it's punishment. A person knows that, they understand that. But if you put this, the, the structure in their sight every day, it really does just become an opportunity. And so I have been in conversations with people to create a, um, a sort of freedom edition of felon, a paperback version that I would give away to 20,000 people. And as a part of those conversations, you know, somebody pushed me and said, you know, 20,000 books is great, but what would you do if you could do more? And what would you do if it wasn't just focused on like your book and giving people your book? And I was like, well, we put 2 million people in prison. I will put a million books in prison. And there you have it. So we're going to get into the details of that for a minute, but uh, give listeners a little of your past. I finished your memoir last night, A Question of Freedom. It's an incredibly powerful book. Um, as I said, it was published in 2009, but it's particularly timely today. And we'll talk about that, I hope, uh, later on in the episode. But what were you doing in prison? How'd you get there? <laughs> yes, yeah, uh you know, my son is downstairs. He's doing a uh, math homework. He's doing school through Zoom. And, and he's, I, eight, he's eight he's, years old? Right? Well, now this is my, my youngest is eight. My oldest is 12. And so okay. fortunately, my youngest could actually go to school. And my oldest, he's one week on, one week off. 
but I just went down there and saw him to check on him, man. And it's just wild thinking about how young 12 is and, and what does it mean? Like, what is the things that you're exposed to mean for who you are? And, uh, and I tell this story, I probably told this story a thousand times, and I always want to find a way to tell it that it's like I'm not making an excuse. So I'll just come out first and say I carjacked somebody when I was 16. I went to a mall in the suburbs in Virginia. I pulled out a gun on somebody, and I took that car, and I was with a friend. My friend was 15, and uh, we both got incarcerated. My friend got sentenced to eight years. I got sentenced to nine years. We both pled guilty. Uh, carjacking in Virginia carries life. And so we pled guilty not knowing how much time we would get. And we stood in front of a judge and could have very well gotten a life sentence. And I'm you know, really grateful and, and, and blessed to be like, you know, I only got nine years, which is an absurdity in a sense, right? But sure. I have friends I talk to now who similar crimes still locked up and locked up for 20 years. But, um, but yeah, I pled guilty. This was in the 90s. You could get tried as an adult and you could still get tried as an adult. But back in the 90s, it was really automatic if you had a, a carjacking a rape or a murder. And so I was automatically tried as an adult. And I spent eight and a half years in, you know, prisons across Virginia. And I and I mentioned my son to start because like I was just so <laughs> young, you know. And uh and 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 nobody ever I mean we really have no reason to talk to children about what should be impossible for even an adult to do. But it's just um terrifying to me really to think that uh my kid is barely, you know, younger than I was when I was in the penitentiary. And it's just like a cruel and, and, and depressing thing to know, such as such as life. And you were you were a successful student um, at, as a as a kid. Uh, you didn't in your book. You say that that car jacket was the first time in your life you'd held a gun in your hand. Yeah. Um, you made a mistake, and the book is a a really poignant, powerful exploration of that mistake, almost in search of an explanation. But of course, the human heart is, I like to quote Faulkner, uh, he talks about the human heart in conflict with itself. I, I think that's a apt description of, of your experience as a teenager then. Um, so you go through this, you do something, you're it, which was horrible, and then you go through something horrible. Um, and books play this crucial role for you. Did they play a role in your life, or describe what kind of role books played in your life before you went into prison? Yeah, I mean, you know, I was a reader, and 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 I was one of those readers who who wasn't, you know, I realized something about myself as a parent. Myself as a parent has made me realize something about myself as a child. So as a child, you know, my mom had books, but she had books that was really kind of like a leisure activity. I mean, it wasn't a yeah. it wasn't a line item in her budget, right? <laughs> but books are like a line item in my budget. You know, I mean, I, I got you. like a thousand books in this room right here. My kid has the. I mean, we didn't have bookshelves in my house growing up, and and I just thought about bookshelves as as a you know piece of furniture that exists in some some people's lives and not others. But I mean to say that, you know, I had books. My mom was a reader, but uh, it wasn't the same way. It wasn't a conduit to something. It was just something I felt was necessary, but that I wasn't really aware of all of the potential and possibilities of books. I think some of my greatest finds were being at friends at, at the House of Friends. You know, James Baldwin, Chinoa Chibe. I would see things on the shelf of people I knew who went to college and think, oh, man, I should be reading that. Uh, I've read a lot of Sherlock Holmes so I was in the books, Walter Mosley. I mean, I read like every Walter Mosley book. <laughs> it's funny because <laughs> like I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know that hardback books got published before the paperback version. And so, you know, my mom would get me, she'd be like, oh, Walter Mosley has a new book. And I would get the paperback not realizing that this new book was like a year old. Sure. <laughs> and, and and I hadn't, you know, they don't teach you and in, in, they didn't teach us in my high school to pay attention to the copyright page. I mean, one, because if you only read dead writers, the copyright page doesn't matter that much. You know, it doesn't really matter what year uh, Tom Sawyer was written. You know, that's not one of the things that a 13-year-old should be perseverating over. Um, but if you talk about contemporary writers, it's, it's kind of important to know, you know, where does Paradise sit along the arc of Toni Morrison's life as a writer, right? But I didn't know that. I just thought the book came out when the book came out. And uh, and it's wild, though, because when, when I went to prison, 
uh, what happened was, uh, <laughs> uh, man, you know, we become things for stu- for the stupidest reasons. And maybe it's not stupid, right? But it was sort of like, um, man, I distinctly remember it. Everybody has a response to tragedy. And I get sentenced. <laughs> the judge says he sentenced me to, so, so it was a mandatory minimum of, uh, what was it? It was a mandatory minimum of 15 years for carjacking. And so then it was a mandatory minimum of five years for robbery. And then it was a mandatory of three for the gun. So no, it was a minimum sentence of 15 for carjacking, a minimum of five for robbery, and a mandatory minimum of three for the gun. So the judge sentenced me to a minimum of 15 for carjacking, but he suspended nine. And then he sentenced me to five for the, for the robbery and the mandatory minimum of three for the gun. And then he ran the six and the five concurrent. But this is not a word that you should know at 16. It's just like no reason necessarily for you to know the word concurrent, right? Yeah. And so I could count, though. And so I'm like <laughs> six, five, three, man, 14 years. I'm going to be 30 years old when I go home. And it, and I just couldn't, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. And uh, I was in a holding cell, though. And I was telling myself, man, well... This is the absurdest response to that kind of news. But I told myself, well, I'm going to be a writer. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to be a writer. Because I thought, you know, I got all of this time. And and um and I don't know why, but my mind immediately went to like, well, what will you do with your life? You know, what will you become? And I had made this decision to be a writer, not knowing. You know, if you were to ask me, actually, are you going to be a fiction writer? You know, you'd be a novelist. Are you going to be an essayist? Are you going to be a poet? Like, had you asked me those questions, you might have scared me. And I might have just been like, you know what? I'm just going to be a mechanic. <laughs> you know, I might have just got, got nervous. But it was nobody for me to articulate the aspiration to. And so it was nobody to discourage me. And it was nobody to ask me sort of like qualifying questions or clarifying questions. And so anyway, once I decided to to be a writer, uh, books became... I read them because I thought it was going to make me a writer, you know, and I just read everything and I read widely and I read all of the time. And I'm certain that I spent eight and a half years in prison. I read something every single day. And for more than half of those days, I I completed something. Um, I finished the book. I finished the short story. I finished the chapter. But every single day saw me um, reading something and finishing something and imagining writing something uh, similar. What did your fellow prisoners think of that habit? Were you unusual, unique? Um, you talk about how people or certain cultures and different prisons you're in of watching soap operas in the afternoon or yeah. cartoons in, on certain days. But you were not the only reader. Um, but how, how was that perceived? Yeah, I mean, you know, people tend to. To, first of all, I felt like I was on the bottom, so I didn't care how I was received. You know, like I was in prison at 16 that made my mom just weep, you know. And um, and I didn't think it was any lower that you could go to being in prison. And, and I didn't feel like I did it simply to prove things to friends or be like friends. I wasn't really trying to blame friends, but I sort of felt like if I want to sit down and read this 500 page fantasy novel at this point, ain't nobody going to shame me in a, in a anything, you know, like I'm already doing this time. And, uh, and so I don't know the way people perceived it is people minded your bit, they minded their business. And a lot of people were readers in prison. The question was just, you know, what were they reading? How much did they read? You know, a lot of people read for leisure. So they pick up a book and they, you know, they might take a month to read it. You know, they might take two months to read it, but it was just something that was there. It was like, like a companion to them. And then for others, it just it just meant more. I, I think about it the way that so, some folks interact with like dogs. You know, they love to see a dog on the street. And, and some people just love to look at the dog on the street. And some people go up to a stranger dog and like ask, can they pet it? You know, and then even in a pet, and some people like get really into it and they like <laughs> playing with it and smiling. And you're like, do you have a dog? And they're like, no, nah, I don't have a dog. It's like, well, you seem like you want one. Nah, you know, I just get my 10 minutes in, my two minutes in, and then I leave. You know, I feel like some people treat books the way they treat that kind of relationship. And, if, you know, for me, man, I, I will say that people looked at, my relationship with books as a marker of my intelligence, 
and they, you know, called me professor, um, okay. called me a poet, and and it, well, not really poet, but called me a professor mostly, called me a teacher, you know, um, and it was the first time I think that people really, just the act of reading actually like shifted the way people saw me in the world. And it is funny, too, because it was in prison and you think that this is the last place that this kind of thing might happen. But people would see my interaction with books and imagine that it signifies some success I would have in the future. And so they saw it also as a look like a distinguishing kind of quality. Mm-hmm. So, it was, you know, I, I will say it's not that I wasn't encouraged as a child, but I will say that men in prison encouraged me more. Um, just sort of subset that I remember. Right. I mean. I got the same kind of biases that everybody else has. But I, I have a stronger sense of people in prison encouraging what I might be because of a book than I got when I was in, in middle school and high school. And the books you chose to read often weren't your choice. It's whatever you could get your hands on. But you did have some opportunity to curate your own selection. And I'm curious how that worked for you and – how you decided what to read when you could have some say in it. Yeah, I mean, it was still sort of like hodgepodge because it was – Ralph Ellison would mention Albert Murray in the essay. So now I'm picking up Albert Murray's train with some guitar. It, it was like – I'm reading John Edgar Wyman. So I'm going to read all of John Edgar Wyman. It was like I know Toni Morrison. It was like, oh, I heard a, this – I heard this – um. I heard, uh, who am I thinking about? It would be like, it would just be the sense of like, um, I can't believe I can't, I can't, I want to say a raisin in the sun, but I'm not even thinking about a raisin in the sun. I'm thinking about, um, Alice Walker's book. It's the color purple. The color purple. I can't believe I couldn't think of the color purple. (laughs) Um, but like, so, so I didn't even read the book until I came home. I read the screenplay and it was some real changes in the screenplay from the book actually and sure. i was like wow i didn't i didn't know that um that the 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 spielberg had did a few things differently and and had kind of subverted some sense of what i thought she was doing in the book but then i read her book on genital mutilation and it wasn't that i was interested necessarily in reading a book about genital mutilation because i didn't know what it was but i knew who alice walker was and then that was the book of hers that they had in the library so that's the one i read and um and, and it was really like that, you know. And when I started purchasing books, it's wild. I read this book on um, Willie Willie Bosket, All God's Children, and I got the book from the library, and I only got it because of the name. I was thinking, who are God's children, you know? And uh, because because when you some of the prisons I was at, they would they would it took about six years under my sentence before I was able to go to a physical library. So all of the other prisons I was at before then that actually had libraries, they would just have like a a. a of uh, like 10 pages with books listed. And so I will pick books based on the name or the author. And I, I end up getting all God's children simply based on the name. And I, I got that and it was about Willie Bosket. And it was about, he murdered two people when he was 15 on a subway in New York. And that led, uh, and at the time, you know, the age of majority in New York was 16. So if you were 16, you went to Rikers and then you went to prison. But if you were under 16, there was no mechanism that existed for them to try you as an adult. So this is in the 70s. So you, you got to imagine me reading this book, having got tried as an adult at 16, and I'm reading and I'm discovering the pattern in a sense of um of how this came about. And so I imagine, and, and after the Bosket case, um, states all across the country started to try juveniles as adults. But think about this discovery just based on the name of a book. You know, if it was named something else, I might not have read it. Um, worse than slavery. You know, I read that. And the interesting thing about that is I, I was just like, what's worse than slavery? And then the book was about prison. And I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's bad, but I don't know if it's like, I don't know if it's worse <clears throat> than slavery. And uh, it was interesting, though, is I read that book and I found out about um you know, convict leasing and, and also that they had juveniles locked up in prison and, and like in parchment in the early 1900s. And so, you know, these books became a kind of a kind of education, a real education for me, but but really like hodgepodge, you know, because one book would just lead me to the next. And sometimes the only thing that would lead me to a book would be the title of the book. And, and you know, you just I've read for different reasons. But but, yeah, I've read a, a lot, actually. Yeah. 
Now, you write in your memoir that you took notes, you kept journals, uh, and you kept notes on the books that you read. Why did you think to do that? And uh, how did that experience, I regret uh, that I didn't take notes on the books I read when I was younger, um, didn't keep track of, I just like, wish I had a list of all the books I've ever read. And I'm curious what motivated you to do that and how extensively it did it. Did you have a strategy or a style that you can share? So, so I, I was motivated to do it first because I kept not forgetting what I read. But some books are garbage. You know, I was reading yeah. like Reader's Digest four books in one. And and it was no way that I would remember what I read. But then also, um, I think it happened the first time I got a book of poems that I really dug and I knew I had to return it. And so I wrote the poems down by hand. Mm-hmm. But I still have that somewhere. And, you know, I will write on the back of request forms. I will write because because the thing is like paper was not expensive, but it's expensive when you make 23 cents an hour. And so you could ask for request forms and the request form always came in duplicate or triplicate. And so you could write on the back of the white page or you could write on the back of the yellow page. And so I did that and I used those request forms because there was no way for me to track what mattered in a book um, if I returned a book. And sometimes what mattered would just be a line. And sometimes what mattered would be, you know, a paragraph. Sometimes what mattered would just be to know what it was that I read. And I did it for a while, you know, pretty religiously, but I found, and maybe this was freeing really, I found that in life is not always like what you see through, but what you, what you find value in beginning. And so I had a lot of beginnings, you know, I would, I would say, all right, I'm going to do it this way this time. And I would do it for a couple of months and then I would not do it for a while and then I'll pick it up and do it again. And so it wasn't really as systematic as I as I would have liked, and it's, it's and it's unfortunate in some sense because I ended up sending um, a bunch of stuff home, you know, books and these notebooks, and they just got lost. You know, I don't know where it went. I mean, UPS maybe got thrown in the trash, never got mailed, and and it's it's it's, it's kind of messed up though because you, I don't know, man. You, you know, I mean, it's a a huge. Yeah, two, three boxes just worth of stuff that I had accumulated. And the only thing you could really accumulate in prison without drawing attention to yourself is uh, is books and paper. And you can have 12 books at a time. And then you can have really as much paper as you want, as long as it could fit in your locker. But you, you had two lockers. And so you could fit a fair amount of like paper in, in two nice-sized foot lockers. And then you go send that stuff home knowing, um, I don't know, understaffed, uh, under-resourced. And who cares about the papers of a prisoner, you know? So a lot of that stuff got lost. But the value that I, I got out of it really was, uh, I think it gave me a sense of some books that really mattered. But also it just it just helped me believe that the books mattered. So just the act of like writing these d- things down, notating them. I mean, the first essay I wrote was because I hated all God's children. I mean, I, I really, you know, he was making this argument that violence was was somehow genetic, and he was talking about Bosque's father, who had also went to prison. And he was like, um, he was he was in the, I think it was, he was a kappa. He was one of those honor societies that you just get based on grades. You know, his his dad was was supposed to have been brilliant, and he got that, and he got a college degree before they ended Pell grants. And and then the notion was that even though his father didn't raise Willie, right, that the violence of his father got transmuted to the son. And then he made this bigger argument to say all of it came from the violence of South Carolina. And the book starts with, you know, early South Carolina legislators and the brutality and violence in a state legislator. And he's just sort of making this argument that all of it was in the blood or the water. And it was like ridiculous, you know, and, 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 and it was like dangerous to me, too. And I spent hours, man, writing this essay just trying to break down all the reasons why, even in his own book, he was pointing to things that led to Bosque's violence that he wasn't acknowledging. From uh, it, it read like it was the suggestion that Bosque had got sexually assaulted as a juvenile in a detention center. It was clear that he didn't have a lot of family support. He had some um, mental illness, um, mental health issues that weren't treated. You know, it was like, uh, anyway, my, my point is that me writing that essay was sort of born out of keeping a list 
it was saying that the book mattered enough for me to remember. And sometimes the way the book mattered meant that I had to engage with it and argue with it. And that essay, that's kind of mad, man. That essay is, is one of the things that got lost, you know. And uh, I would love to know. I mean, I know what I wrote because I still feel so <laughs> angry about the book. I think we just heard an excerpt from it. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you write in a journal now when you read? Uh, do you write in the books? Those books you had in prison, you were were borrowed, so you right. typically, so you'd have to return them. So there'd be no point in writing. Although occasionally, I suspect you'd want to write something in them to, it's a message to other people. But um, do you write in your books now? Do you take notes? I, you know, I should say, man, I wish I did write in books then, but I didn't. I I I thought it was it's like a religious experience, and I'm not even a religious person, but but I did feel like reading was the closest thing to a religious experience. I really understood. And, you know, people say things like my body is my temple. And so they have all of these rules about what they will and won't do. Well, I really did think of the other book as a temple. And so I, I wouldn't lay the book flat on its spine. I would, I would like read, like I, I got this book here and it's a pretty big paperback book. And like, you know, I, I got this book, but if I was reading it in prison, I would read it like this. You know, I would like, I wouldn't open wouldn't, it all wouldn't the way. Wouldn't open it all the way, yeah. Because sure. I wouldn't want to crack the spine. Um, and especially, oh, you would you would dig this, right? Um, especially if I had something like this. What's that? Um, or for people who are not oh, watching this oh, yeah. on YouTube? The, Go ahead. Um, the Brothers Karamazov. Kar oh, yeah. Yeah. And so I would never open this all the way because it's just a spine. I was like, I would be offending the book. And so I, so in prison, I would never write in a book. And, and part of that was <laughs> I, I developed my own relationship with books based on how I thought dignity and respect worked and, and like dignity and respect worked in prison. Like if you don't touch somebody without consent and their permission, then you are affording them a measure of dignity and respect that is like critical to surviving in a world like this. And so I was treating books the same way. Uh, and it wasn't until I got in college really when I came home and I started going to college that I, I actually gave myself permission to, to write in a book. And I gave myself permission to, dog ear pages, you know, and um, and so now I write in books all the time and it's just a part of my habit and practice of reading. And if it's like a particular line or something that I really want to hold on to, then I'll write it somewhere um, outside of the book, particularly if I'm, if I'm thinking that it's meaningful in a way that I would want to like include it in, in, in something that I'm writing, then I'll definitely like pull it out and write it somewhere else. And, and part of that just came from, in prison, I, I actually didn't even know it's so funny, man. I thought people wrote everything out of their own head. You know, I didn't understand the way in which books beget other books. Yeah. I, I thought it was all a matter of like a literary genius. And, and it's only been since I came home that I've begun to see how, and, and this is actually what I regret most about those nights. I ain't nobody wants to go to prison, but man, I could have used that time in a different way, in a different way. And I wouldn't, I don't want it back at all. But, uh, if I had some kind of blueprint before, and, and maybe that's really what the Freedom Libraries and a Million Book Project is about, is is to say that sometimes all you have is that time, and it would be a wonderful thing to just have a, a, a real sense of how you might organize that time around books and literature to build a life that you feel mean, is, is meaningful, you know? You say you don't want it back. Why not? The nine years, eight and a half years. Well, because it's like a... Well, I guess I mean two things. One, I mean, uh, I don't want to do the time over again. You know, it's like I just don't. And then the other thing is that um, I actually don't think I would have got. So I'm, I'm complaining about not having the kind of relationship with books and literature that I have now. And not having an understanding around books and literature that I have now. But what I know is that if it wasn't for prison, I wouldn't have the one that I have right now. You know, if I was replacing that nine years with something else, I just don't think it would have been with um, all of this. You know, I mean, I, somebody introduced me to France for non as a 16 year old in prison. I mean, I was 16 in prison and got introduced to France for non by this young black gay dude. It's like this doesn't happen. You know, this, this is like this is not how you get introduced to one of the like brilliant thinkers of the 20th century or whatever, right? And um, and I couldn't understand a word of what I was reading. Black skin, white mask, I didn't understand this. You know, wretched of the earth. The only thing I understood was uh, was like some of the stories and, and, and I remember them and I carried them with me. And it was one story in wretched of the earth about uh, this Algerian kid, this Algerian kids that, that killed their French friend. 
And um, and so Fanon was treating him and, and he was like, you know, why why did you do this thing? And um, and they said, Have you ever heard of a Frenchman going to jail for killing an Algerian? And that story always stuck with me because um because that is just such an inadequate explanation for taking somebody's life. And what it made me realize, at least the story for me, is like my own crime and my own violence. It's how, you know, we all tell ourselves stories about why we do things. And and I, I still can't remember what Fanon said after that, but but I remember that childlike thinking. And, and what I do remember about the childlike thinking was that, like, I was rationalizing the things that I was doing in the same way these Algerian kids were rationalizing, like, you know, what they had done. And um. And so it's strange, though, because you read a book and in some ways it's a really selfish act. And in a world where you can't be selfish, in a world of prison, where you can't be selfish really uh, without somehow imposing upon the dignity and safety of others, the, the book was a way to be like, I'm going to take this time for myself. And, and, and what I get from this book only has to like matter to me. And then when you got a little bit more sophisticated, you'd be like, you know what, I want to make sure you know why this matters and prove I'm right about what matters about it. But at first it was just... I could try to like know myself a bit better by reading this work, even if all I'm knowing is how how much I still don't know. You know, that's that's kind of cool, sure. too. Uh, you have a line in your book, which I which is precious to me. Uh, you say, um, quote, there's something about waking up every morning to your life in a box that makes you want to learn to be more than you were when you went to sleep the night before. And that's, um, end quote, that's, should be all of our missions in life, I think, to some extent. Otherwise, we're just no different from a, a horse <laughs> dragging a cart around all day. Is, uh, if we want to express what's human in ourselves, we want to be more the next day than we were the night before when we lay down. It's hard to do. Yeah. Um, and books, obviously, uh, Recent Econ Talk episode, you haven't heard yet, Dwayne, because that hasn't aired yet, but with Zena Hits on her book, Lost in Thought. And it's, you know, her book is a defense, really, of that there's something essentially human about communing with authors dead and alive, especially dead ones, though, because you can't talk to them otherwise. <clears throat> and, yeah. and you can have that conversation that um, a horse can't have. So there's something... <laughs> deeply transformative about it if you let it do its work. I think one of the things that I've admired about Econ Talk, and I, I can't even really remember how I started listening to it, but one of the things I, I really admire about it is um, it's like you engage with books and you engage with authors about their books, but then frequently the authors, the best of them, talk about the books that they've read and the books that fueled their work. Because I, I do think um, what prison taught me maybe that I really didn't know before is that um it's 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 it's, it's almost like a lineage from one book to the next but then it's a shadow lineage too and so it would always be interesting and so somebody would be like are you reading Harry Potter I'd be like nah I've read Tolkien I'm, I'm I'm good I'm not actually I'm, I'm not gonna read that and um and, and it would be wild, though, the way that I would get introduced to books by people who I wouldn't expect to be reading certain things. And then those introductions became also a part of the shadow lineage. And so I know the dude that introduced me to Tolkien. And he was just like, you know, young dude locked up for shooting somebody. Um, I, I think he was smart, but but he wasn't like a, he wasn't like I'm going to college or, you know, he, he just liked books. He liked to talk about books. And 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 then the wild thing is he was like, Oh, we were talking about the white ninja. I'm in the hole and I'm talking about the white ninja by um I can't remember the guy who wrote it. But it was in a, a vein of books that's like Shibumi by this Catravanian and they kinda like thrillers, right? Yeah. And I was talking about this book called The White Ninja, which, you know, one of the things that pulled me to these books was it really ended up being about what it meant to be moral. Like at the end of the day, that's just what the book is. And and it's wild that you got all of these cats in prison that's really reading books that's making arguments about what it is, what it is to be moral and what it is to sacrifice something on principle. And so I'm, I'm yelling back and forth, arguing about this book. And the guy in the cell next to me was like, you know, I think you were like Tolkien. 
And I was like, what? This is like <laughs> 17 different continents away, you know, and I yeah. read talking and I'm fascinated by it. And then me and this guy ended up being in a cell together and he just wouldn't be the person that I would have typecast to recommend talking to me. And, and so what I learned is that, you know, these books have a lineage based on the authors that the books are communicating with and the authors that the, the books that shape the authors of the books. Right. But it's also this shadow lineage where it's like who introduced you to what? And, and when you begin to realize that, um, I don't know, man, it's like democratic. It's like the, reading is probably one of the more democratic things that we could do. And, and that's why I think literacy is so important because you you, you really can't. Um, I mean, I, I we can meet intellectually over a book oftentimes in a way that we can't over our lives. Because, oh, yeah. you know, because it's like really hard to. It's like really hard not to admit some of the uh, biases that that we have uh, when we examine in our lives and books. It's just too rich, you know. Um, so, so you yeah, I've been it, fortunate. You make an interesting point, which is also came up in the <clears throat> Zena Hits interview, which is how do we talk to people from a different social class than we are? That can be challenging. Books are obviously one way we do that. Uh, we can talk to someone who's radically different, whose l daily life is radically different from ours. So um, The Life of the Mind, which has a pretentious, um, uh, unrealism about it is really not the right way to think about it. That phrase doesn't capture what I'm talking about. It really more that our, everyone's inner life can be touched by something they've read and can share that and create that web, that network of, of conversation with living people recommending and liking and discussing the ideas in books, plus the dead folks who wrote them sometimes and who were influenced by their predecessors, none of which are alive. I mean, it's, uh, as I said, I think, you know, I think it's a quintessentially human experience when approached the way that, that you're talking about, not for leisure, although leisure is okay. I mean, I, I've read, there was a period of my life where I read, uh, I don't know, I read a myst a myst two or three mysteries a week just for fun. Uh, yeah. They're in a box in the basement. They're probably water damaged. I, I, they used to be precious to me because they were my my journal. They're, those are all the, those those mysteries. And, and, I, and I tried to read, quote, good mysteries. And there's a lot of really fine British mystery writers who I, who I came to love. But uh, that's not the same as grappling with uh, something a little harder. But, but, it's but not, they're, both, it's, they're all good. It's interesting though, because like there's two points. I, I think like, so first, like for me, the the mystery sometimes what I realize is, is like when I would try to go back to some of the stuff that I really really enjoyed when I was younger, or I would try to read like a new mystery writer, I'd be like, yeah, nah, this just took me two hours to read. I think, <laughs> mm. you know, and I'm and I'm like predicting what's gonna happen next, yeah. and I'm like, and I can't really I can't really ask myself who this person is because it's just. It's just shorthand in so much of the details, you know? And I was like, man, was Walter Mosley as good as I thought he was? <laughs> you know, and it's like, and you just, it is hard to know. But then the other thing, because you did a, a, um, a couple of shows on this, right? One was uh, Epstein, talking to Epstein about David his Epstein. book. Range. And, and, and like, Range is sort of like, like chess is not that interesting, you know, like, and like, <laughs> and like, I like tennis, but it's not really tennis, like Tiger Woods. These aren't really the substance of, of like deep conversations. Right. But that book really is about how you can have a really deep and sophisticated discussion about the effort that goes into producing. Um, Great. You know, right. And then, and then a recent book, um, The Hash Creep. And, and I read, the, I read, and it's interesting too, because I read Hank Range and The Hash Creep. But did you take The Hash Creep? And it's sort of like, um, that was funny too. The Hot Hand. The Hot, the hot hand. hand by Ben Cohen. Yeah. The by other ben Cohen. recent guest. Yeah. If um, it was a recent, this is wow, you wouldn't even believe this. So it was a, a Facebook ad or, or a Twitter ad that was just a, a clip of the Boston Celtics game. And, and, and Smart had hit like five three pointers in a row. <laughs> and so they had the thing from the video game. He's on fire. And they also had the basketball turning into a ball of flame. And so it really made me think about the high hand. But what's interesting is that 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 those five shots he made in that basketball game just wasn't going to be the substance of really deep and provocative intellectual thought. But did it become such when we argue about whether or not like 
did he actually had a hot hand? Or if you if you look over 100 shots, you'll find that he made the same 30 over that 100 that he makes over every 100 in his career, you know? <laughs> and so it's, it's just interesting. I think this is part of the joy, though. It's like books at their best could, could lift up the more mundane aspects of daily living to the point of being worthy of, like, meaningful contemplation. And and even at their worst, they're still as like enjoyable as a basketball game, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. so you, you can't really lose. Yeah, that's a good ad. That's a good ad, Dwayne. Uh, let's talk about the the project in a little more detail. Uh, the um, Million Book Project. How are you deciding what the five hundred books are that would be this curated library, and then, <clears throat> well, anything go along with it besides just the the collection of 500 books yeah. and and are all prisons that you've contacted or have you yet to contact them are they going to take them do they have so, room for them yeah, so 500 I'll, books is a i'm looking at my 500 books it's a pretty big it's not a small amount of shelf space yeah so so one um let's just take the space issue yeah the the a, a typical prison unit so it's, it's a challenge because you have dormitories or whatever, but a typical prison unit is nothing that decorates the walls, period. So when you think about shelf space, the only thing on the walls would be some phones. And so you have to think about, well, where could you put it? But a lot of times it's, it's a fair amount of wall space that's free. So you could just use the, the wall space. And that's one reason why you want it in the units. In the libraries, you might say that it's not enough shelf space, Um but you say, well, we don't want to have it in the library because the library has a limited number of people who could go there anyway. And you kind of want it to be in somebody's living space in the same way that our books exist in our living spaces. But I have to be flexible, though, and, and that's just sort of R&D part of this is figuring out what is the best way to present it. Because you do want to present it as a shelf of books, but maybe you don't present all 500. Maybe you create a, a, a kind of storage system that has a rotating collection of 50 that you see and and then you say well okay if it's a rotating collection of 50 well what does that do for um the, the sort of actual act and art of browsing a book collection i mean that's part yeah. of this and i say well listen i used to get these pamphlets with books in it and i had the titles and i found good books but even I don't think that's enough. So what would I do to add another layer to that? What are other layers we create? And we're thinking about this all as a museum exhibit. And if you think about a, a, a museum, sometimes they can show all of the pieces in their collection. But sometimes the museum is bigger and, and they can't. But they still have to have a way to categorize and, and just know what's there. So we're going to create blurbs about the books in the collection. And some of the blurbs are verge on, on micro essays, you know. The idea is that most of them will be micro essays, but some might be a, a bit longer than a micro essay, but not that much longer. And the idea would be you could go to this to get a sense of what it is that's in the book. And that sense will both be – it'll be idiosyncratic, though. It, it won't be this is the story of yeah. a man obsessed with a whale. <laughs> it'll be like, <laughs> honestly, man, I, you know, I read Moby Dick to my nine-year-old son, and, and we just got lost in it. I mean, in this joint, you got chapters that's giving you a dissertation on the 17 types of whales. I don't think none of that stuff was true, by the way, but it was fascinating <laughs> to read. You know, do you know how they split the shares on a whaling ship? You know, and what drives a man to like get on a ship and spend that much time in the water? And, and you know, that kind of thing. If somebody reads that, I think that they read it and get a better sense of why they might want to pick up the book. And then they browse the book and then they read the book. So part of it is creating that. And that's something that will accompany all of the Freedom Libraries. Another thing I realized um, talking to uh, somebody. So so let me just talk about the curation process. There's three sort of steps. One, I'm taking founders' rights and I'm picking the first 250 myself uh, with Elizabeth Hinton. We're just picking the first 250. The second 250, and even in picking that 250, though, I'm, I'm being influenced by friends. I'm having conversations. It's not sure. just, you know. Yeah. But the second 250 is is, is 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 more cultivated, I think, and more curated in the sense that we have three strategies. One is a survey, and uh, and a survey is I, I think is pretty fascinating because it's asking like, what book made you see the world differently? What book did you find so engaging that that like you read and it had to give it to somebody else? Uh, what book did you read that you, that was controversial that you thought you weren't supposed to read? 
you know, or that somebody told you you could read your high school didn't permit it or something. What what was that book and and and, and what was your response to it? And so yeah, these questions and the ideas that it will drive will help create a list of titles. And then we've been hosting these things called book circles, which have actually really been fascinating because uh, what it is is a Zoom call with three people, four people, five people, and they just discuss the books that they love. And that's been fascinating for a couple of reasons, right? Because the content we're, we're creating is both generating titles, but generating the antidotes about how yeah. and why books matter. Because sure. I think the antidotes in this sense are just as powerful as the titles. And we'll end up finding different ways to disseminate the antidotes both to people in the public and people on the inside. And then the last way is uh, your life as a reader. Now, this is a series that I thought initially would be driven more to getting book titles, but it's actually been... Um, in some ways more complex than that, and in some ways, uh, yeah, more complex than that. Because what I what I do is I talk to somebody about their life as a reader. How do you change as a reader? How have I changed? I'm 40. How do my reading habits change now? And, and what were they when I was, you know, 13, 14, 15, to college and, and beyond? And actually, in the early discussions, I found out a few things that's really fascinating. You know, my son's experience with books is completely different because he picked up a question of freedom. He's 12, hmm. and it's like, that's your memoir. That's my memoir. And he's 12. And I'm asking myself, do I let him read this book? Well, I can't tell him not to read the book. It's like, that's the sin. You know, you say like this book is not appropriate for you because it's like me saying my life is not appropriate for him. And and Pen- Pandora's box has been open since he was five. So here you could read it, you know. Um, so anyway, what I learned, though, is uh. I was talking to somebody and they and I, I thought because you have two ways of reading. And that's what I learned from this piece is I give uh, he picks up my book because it's on the floor. It's on the shelf. And so he's been exposed to all kinds of books because it's just a lot of books around. He reads multiple books at a time because he sees me and his mom reading a lot of books at a time. We talk about books with him. But I realized that for a lot of folks, they don't begin to understand their like capacity to read a lot. Even for different folks in the same house, they might not get that capacity to read deeply and intensely um, across book and across genre until they get to college. When all of a sudden somebody says, yeah, you only have four classes this semester and you've been having eight classes your whole life. And you're like, this is easy, just four classes. And then you get the syllabus and each class has five books and you got to read 20 books over the course of like 14 weeks. And this is the first time that you read that deeply, that intensely and that focus. And so um, so I, I forgot that, you know, even though I've been a college student, even though I've experienced that, I just kind of forgot. And somebody told me that in one of these like your life as a reader conversations. And so the other thing we produce in is a, a syllabus. And the syllabus is, 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 is not generated by books because, again, It'll be far less people who get access to these freedom libraries than are in prison. And that's just that's just a fact of life, right? But uh, we're trying to produce this syllabus and 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 work to have the materials and the syllabus included so that you have a, a piece of nonfiction, a piece of fiction, and a piece of poetry each week, and then a writing prompt. And um and it's 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 pattern after imagining if you were um had a tutor. And what you had to do each week was read certain things and then write a letter to your tutor about what you read. Because some people read and aren't accustomed to talking about what they read or don't have somebody to talk about what they read to. And so each week you expect to write this this letter about what you read. Um, each week I'm producing a sort of mini lecture about metaphor, about simile, about polysyndeton, about asyndeton, about zoegma, about perspective, um, about voice, just short mini lessons that somehow get echoed in the readings. And then um, and then I produce a transcript for that if they don't have access to video within that particular prison. And then we'll send that around. And the idea is that this is essentially kind of like a anthology, but all of the works within it go back and echo within a freedom library. So that becomes a, another resource, whether you had a freedom library or not, to give you a sense of how you might read some of these works together, but how you would engage with them. And um, and that's mainly, you know, what we're including, the syllabus, the catalog, and then we're also including the author visits. And the author visits are, are sort of going to be available to everybody in a sense that, well, not everybody, but in the sense that um, we have selected 52 ambassadors to be a part of the project. And those ambassadors would commit to say, um, 
And it'll be writers whose work is in it or who just want to be affiliated with the project and do this work. And then they would commit to going into a prison. And when they go into a prison, we would send either multiple copies of their book or multiple copies of a book that they want to discuss. And it's sort of a way to see the book club. And then the last piece that we're doing is um, we're actually also doing a book club and, and we're seeing a book club and the, the titles for the book club is like some, will be some of the titles from the Freedom Library. And then we'll be sending them in to some subset of prisons across the country, um, hopefully beginning November 1st. And then that's a way to, to engage right now. But it's also a way to build a relationship with different programs that exist around the country in different states and different prisons and also to encourage the reading in concert. So we got, you know, it's this one big project, but the big project has a number of smaller projects all pushing towards making the book, making an argument for the book being a central aspect of a person's relationship with themselves through a period of incarceration. And you think about your 250 or the whole list. I think there's a, a temptation we all have to say, well, so for example, the way I, I've talked about this on the program, I think, but, you know, my father was a huge influence on me as a reader and I, ex he expected me to read the books that he wanted, that he liked to read when he was my age at different times. And I expected to like those books and it, that wasn't always true. Right. <laughs> uh, and so same for my kids. I mean, Dickens is one of my favorite writers. And my favorite Dickens novel is Our Mutual Friend, an obscure one. Um, my second choice would be Great Expectations, probably. And none of my kids like those two books, like those books. It, 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 it's hard for me, you know, um, but that's OK that, you know, you, you, you come to learn that that's for a whole bunch of reasons. They're not going to like everything you like. It's not just books. Um, they have to find their own path. But I'm when I think about curating, you know, what would be my list of, of 500 books for, I can't, I have nothing to say about what would be useful for prisoners, but what would be useful for a person who, say, wanted to be educated or wanted to think about morality or to think about human nature, you know, my list would be very different from yours. And my natural impulse would be to choose the books that influenced me. Are you yeah. doing that? Are, are you no. trying to be... How are you? How are you dealing with that? So, so first, I should say that like great expectations, and one other interesting thing I'm trying to do because I, you know, it, a lot of the books that's in the public domain is less expensive for me to print them myself than the than the pay for them. And so, like great expectations would be there. Count of Monte Cristo would be there. I never read Great Expectations, but I read David Copperfield. I read Oliver Twist. You know, I read a bunch of Dickens, but just not Great Expectations. Um, it's it's there because a friend just swears by it, and uh, and actually bought it to read it. Because uh, I feel like I should read at least sixty percent of the books that's in there, you know. Yeah, totally. And uh, <laughs> and uh, and it's so funny. I read the first page to my son. He was like, "You know, Dad, I'm good." <laughs> he, he was like, "He was like, I don't, I don't want to read this." And I was like, "You sure?" Because it gets better. He was like, "You know, the the mom is dead. The the dad is dead. Uh, he's working in a workhouse. I, what's a workhouse?" <laughs> yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah. Dwayne's already given away the key plot line of Great Expectations. But, but that's it's about an orphan. First, that's sort of for so many yeah. of uh, I, I told I told myself I was like, look, so many of Dickens' books are about orphans. It's just yeah. you got to deal with it. And he was like, no, I don't. <laughs> he was like, let's read that book. Um, but so like I'm gonna have the Great Expectations, but then I'm gonna have somebody. I'm gonna have a, 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 this guy named Nicholas Davidoff write yeah. the introduction. I like him. Yeah. yeah. So he's going to write a, a new introduction. But what's kind of fascinating is that so some of these texts, you, you might not like them. But the question is, why? Like, why? And that's one of the things that like I can't really tell my sons why I love some of the books I love. I mean, I can, but it's hard not to be real didactic about it. And, and yeah. it's hard, you know, maybe when they're grown, I think I might be able to have a different kind of conversation with yeah. them because because. Sure. I care about their response maybe more when they're grown. So like me and you, we might talk about a book that you love and I and I don't. And we can have a real conversation about it from a sense of mutual respect. I don't know if I necessarily respect my eight year old's opinion <laughs> about <laughs> great expectations. You know, I'm like, <laughs> like I'm like, that's kind of shallow, kid. <laughs> so so um 
So that's one way to deal with it, though, is to have some of these books that's like not that's that's in the public domain to have mm-hmm. people who love those books write the sort of new introduction for a short, you know, thousand pages, but a thousand I mean, words. A, yeah. a thousand words. Yeah. But they would never get asked. None of us is going to get asked to write the intro to Great Expectations, even if Penguin produces a new volume, because it's going to be the new annotated version introduced by a steam, yeah. you know, English scholar. <laughs> And then we're not going to want to read that. And then you be like, don't read the introduction, just read the book, you know. <laughs> but, but hopefully this is an introduction that we think will matter. So that's like one way. And then in terms of like, and it's also a way to check my own biases, though, because I, I listen to people when I listen to the case they make for books. And I'm thinking about how, and listening to that case is really about how the book that they mention works in concert with, you know, Malcolm X. If we're talking about great expectations, how do you create a really interesting run of seven books that includes great expectations that would be really disarming for somebody who's both familiar with like great expectations and and Malcolm X? That would be kind of fascinating to me or great expectations and the Count of Monte Cristo. And um, so so I think that's some of the things I'm thinking about. And then I, it, it is important to have a mix of what we might consider classics. And and then also what we might because it's, it's it's easy to get lost in in like today, and and I, I look at the books that won the Pulitzer Prize in poetry in like 1960 and 1970, and a lot of those books have been forgotten, but they are books from the 60s and the 70s and the 80s that we still remember, and a lot of times those weren't the books that won big prizes, and sometimes you just need a you need Wendell Berry to be a part of this, <laughs> and, and and it's just like you know ethically or something so and so it's, it's, it's figuring out how to and then and then also it's like these weird questions about region you you gotta have you gotta touch on region and, and this is and, and and you have to find a way I, I have to find a way to um include books that you know crisscross the country and sort of crisscross the world and so Faulkner is represented but how is Faulkner represented i'm reading absalom absalom now it's like this is this is a good book I, I like this. I, I like where this is going. I love the writing in this. I love the riffs and the tangents. But maybe this isn't the Faulkner that should be here. And, you know, how do I make that decision? Or um, Crime and Punishment is the obvious choice for Dostoevsky. But, you know, yep. I think it's, it's going to be the Brothers Karamazov. And, and so it's always oh, this is a thousand competing interests. And maybe this is the more daunting aspect of the project. But it's also sort of the more fun aspect of the project because... I could always say this is not the end, oh, you know, sure. and, and, and it's like, and anyway, nobody's going to be like, so you really decided, like, for instance, I can't, and I, the only thing I might include all of um, is August Wilson, you know, his whole play cycle. And one of the reasons is, is, is first, I actually don't even think it exists in paperback right now. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's going to have to be an argument with the publisher not an argument, but I'm gonna have to convince the publisher, yeah. yeah, to to produce it in in, in, in paperback. But also, um, it's interesting because I just think his work is completely missing from prison, like totally missing. Because I don't think the works are in. I have, I, I guess they probably are in paperback. It's just I might just had a hardback. But people don't buy. You don't only plays you see in prison that I've ever seen in prison are like Shakespeare. And I'm I'm certain that um that people who 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 teach theater in prison bring more more plays in, but just I only ever really saw Shakespeare. So, but I don't know. That's an argument that I'm having with myself too. You know, who's who? What authors can you include more than one book? Um, and then what about the stuff that I didn't read? Because I didn't have a classic education. So I read Plato because I took a few philosophy classes. Uh, but I, I I know Kant because a lot of my friends are. Um, philosophers. A couple of my good friends are philosophers. And so I, I just kind of know Kant, but I've never read Kant. And so it has to be more than just about me. Partly it's about me. It, it, well, the 250 is all about me, but it's not <laughs> all about me in terms of will I love. Sometimes sure. it's, it's aspirationally me. Yeah. So like Adam Smith, I didn't know Adam Smith could write. And, <laughs> and, and the thing is like, the thing is like, um, most of my friends aren't economists, I guess, right? Yeah. And, and so, like, you know, nobody I know says Adam Smith, you know, unless he plays quarterback for the for the Cincinnati Bengals, and I don't know it. <laughs> um, but his writing it is good, and it reminds me of writing of that era. 
but it's also trying to do something different though. You know, it's like, it's like reaching for meaning in a way that, that you just get in the, in the richest books. And so I don't know if I would have read his classic book. Um, I don't even know the name of on capitalism. The Wealth of Nations. The Wealth of Nations. Like, I don't know if I would have read that by the time we go to print, but I, I think it's important for that book to be in there because, you know, sometimes you set a path for who you become while you're in prison and then you get out and you're on that path and because you set that path, whatever it is, it begins to exclude certain things. So I'm 40 now and I'm returning to the Wealth of Nations, but it's mainly through my engagement with Econ Talk and some of, and some of your guests. It's, it, it, so in my professional life, it would have actually been no reason for me to loop back around to Adam Smith. And so I want to make sure that it's, it's work in the collection that allows people to have an opportunity. I mean, I met, I'm now I'm about to pronounce his name wrong, but Weber, you know, I read him when I was 16 and it was so daunting and so difficult and so challenging. You know about Max, just, Max, the yeah. Protestant ethic. Yeah. I was like, I, I read it and that was it. I, I didn't return to it. And some, some things you have to return to though. And some things you have to have on the shelf just because it's also an argument for the difficulty of, of the work. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say, though, about what I'm including is I also talked to this reading expert. And I've been thinking about this, too. You know, a lot of people in prison read at a fourth or fifth grade level. And some of that is communicated not in um, not in like a, a really difficult book, like an older book written like like Adam Smith is difficult. Even the excerpts you mm-hmm. have in, in your book is difficult. Dolph's guest gives difficult. But some of the difficulty is just in in length and right. in the kind of attention that that the reading requires. And so I've been playing around with how to create material that accompanies the book that, that gives others access into it. So even that's um, having readers and, and what I hope to produce to be part podcast, part, um, part television show is um, they would read a story for 10 minutes and they would read their story. And that way you have an audio version of them reading it and and I hope that it, it it makes the 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 work more familiar, because it's also this notion that you only read a book one time, and the stuff that we really know, you know, I think it's as difficult to know music, good music is as difficult to really know it as it is to know a good book, but we take for granted the need to um, listen to a song multiple times, and we, we you know coming up, I just didn't believe in reading books twice. I didn't re- believe in reading passages twice. And so it's like, how do you encourage that? So I think the project is about finding ways to encourage all of these different ways to, of making meaning out of the material um, in the set and making arguments out of how people are situated towards that material. So your memoir was all beautifully said. I just want to put in a footnote. I wouldn't put Kant in the, in the library, but uh, just because he's he, – or Hegel. They, they, they're they really – or or uh, Heidegger. But there, there's a group of people that you can't read. Uh, but I would put I would put some Homer, even though he's challenging. But um, – But see, no, but, you got to put Homer because you put the Iliad in there, but then you put Derek Walcott's um, mm-hmm. book in there. That's that's basically a riff on the Iliad. And you have yep. them together, and it creates this, this conversation that you're like, oh, this is what you mean by books echoing other books. So now I wanted you to get the, get that – that two volume set of the Fagel's translation of the Iliad and the Odyssey, and we'll count that as one. <laughs> yeah, you can't yeah. leave off the Odyssey. And, and yeah. it, by the way, I, I tell this to, you know, you we talked about this a little bit off the off the air uh, in another conversation, but um, and Doug Lamov talks about this in my conversation with him about reading, which is when you read to your kids, it's a it's a good idea to read books that that are too hard for them. Uh, that you have to stop and explain stuff and hear their reaction and see what they grasp and don't grasp. And I strongly recommend, I, you mentioned you have an eight-year-old son and maybe the 12-year-old, I strongly recommend reading at least excerpts of the Odyssey uh, by Homer to your to your children because it is it is cinematic, it's accessible, the language is so rich, It's and it's riveting. It's not like great expectations, think, at least one for my kids. I think I'm, I am going to do that for both because, you know, my, my 12-year-old, he reads all of um, Riordan. And so, you know, he reads knows what? all, all oh, of Rick, 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 No, Rick Riordan, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, 
And um, and so he knows all of the Greek mythology, right? But then, you know, we ended up getting him books of Greek mythology, like the classic stories. Yeah. And so, but he's never read Homer. He's read, he's like heard excerpts and he's heard the stories. And so it'd be really interesting reading it with him in a room because he he yeah. knows the stories. It's, and, and so it's kind of cool. to and, to and also for him, it does the same thing. He's like, oh, yeah, this is Percy Jackson. This is where that came from. Yeah, oh, it's the shadow know, lineage. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Um, or the lineage, and then your reaction is the shadow lineage, I guess. Yeah. Um, your book, your memoir, Question of Freedom, inevitably deals with racial issues. You're one of numerous Black young men in that book who are incarcerated together, uh, typically with, not always, not exclusively, but typically with many white guards um, and white judges and white administrators of the prison and curious what what your thoughts are in our current environment i don't even know if i can handle this way and maybe you can't either but just segue from this conversation um but your book made me think about obviously the current environment and the tragedy of of race in the united states and i'm curious if your thoughts have changed since you wrote that book uh about how yeah. how the system works and how i hate to use that word the system because it yeah. it's a shorthand for a million things it makes right. it sound like it's one the social challenges of growing up black in america and and how that might get better and your project is one i love your project because it is uh it's going to try to make a difference one book at a time one reader at a time and i think that's one way we change the world but of course right now there's a lot of clamoring for more dramatic ways i'm just curious what your thoughts are you know i, I would say one thing about books and reading i think that matters a lot you think about it is um one way that it matters a lot is if you read prison memoirs over over the stretch. So you you go back to Manchild in the Promised Land. Uh, you read Race Horse. You read um it makes me want to holler by McCall. I mean uh, you just go back right and uh and and you think about my book. You think about Malcolm X. What you find, you read Brothers and Keepers by John Edgar Wyman, which was, which was written in 1984. Um, what you find is there's always been a really complicated relationship with black folks in the system. But you find that um, the way that that's been described has, has always changed and has always been conditioned on factors that are specific to those time periods. Now, the challenge now is that, you know, we talk about so much of this stuff as if it was a plan that could be traced back to X point in the past. But if you go to the literature, it's like when well, nobody seems to talk about it in that way. And when I think about my own experience, you know, what I remember is that my family was in court for me and I faced life for carjacking. And this was around the super predator era but it was nobody clamoring to say that this shouldn't be going on. A friend of mine got 63 years with no parole for um, attempted capital murder. The gun never went off, right? He tried to take the gun from the police, and he says he tried to shoot himself. The cop says he tried to shoot him, but the gun never went off. And he had also tried to commit suicide a little while before, so it was evidence of suicide in his past or attempted you know, suicide. We wrote the ACLU to say, listen, he has 63 years in a state that doesn't have parole for something that happened when he was 16. And it's a dispute about whether or not it is what they say it is. And the ACLU sent us a form letter back. This is not what we deal with. And so like for me, the first step is to try really hard to disentangle the kind of ideological, political argument about incarceration. Because that argument frequently boxes out so many people I know anyway. You got a homicide. You got a murder. You end up living in, to a large degree outside of the specter of advocacy. If you're a nonviolent drug offender, if you got some kind of nonviolent crime, then that's the central focus of the discussion of prison being wrong. But nobody is really saying, I think, how disastrous prison is, even in the context of violence that has been committed. Because because we don't know how to grapple with that violence that has been committed. 
And and you had mentioned something earlier when it was like, oh, you mentioned my book, you know, A Question of Freedom. A lot of it is grasping for, it's like articulating this question. And maybe the point is like to articulate the question. I think, I mean, I think that that was just my default as a writer because I don't have any answers. You know, I, I got a job at the Atlantic, right? And I was working and, and my son was born that, that November. And so I worked the summer before and then I was going to University of Maryland. My son was born in November. And like in, in, in January or sometime, I got invited back by um, James Gibney, who was the managing editor at the time. And we were having lunch. And I got my kid there and I'm feeling like a dad, you know, I'm a new dad. And I parked and I'm, 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 I'm excited just because I negotiated the DT streets with this newborn who's so small that he's still in a carry-on stroller, you know. I sit him down. One of the first times I ever asked for like a high chair, you know, for the kid sit down and talk. And he's like, you know, somebody carjacked me in my driveway. And, and, and we did not have a conversation about the racial dynamics of incarceration in America. Because that's not the conversation you have when you harm somebody and somebody sees you and thinks about the way that they were harmed when they see you. And and I remember that he could have blocked me getting a job, you know, and he didn't. And it was it was a really cool job for me to have. But but we had a conversation. I have no idea of what we said, right? Um, and I'm meandering, but I think in my meandering, I'm trying to say that what I think about the current moment is that frequently the moment is invested in what it means to win. And everybody is invested in what it means to win. And I could make a case. I mean, you say that in, in the book, you know, you come I can make a case for anything. I don't hire prosecutors. I've been a defense attorney. You know, I've worked for judges. I've worked on cases with people's appeals. And I'm like, I don't know if this person should not be in prison. He chopped somebody's head off. You know, and, and like the rhetoric doesn't allow you to have a real conversation about how do you respond to somebody who chopped somebody's head off? And so what I think is that you know, we talk about like difficult books, but we don't talk enough about difficult writing. And I think the writing, which is how I learned how to think, I think the writing about violence and incarceration and race is like the most complicated thing that's on America's radar. Uh, and I don't know, you know, how you I don't know how we respond to it, you know, and I think that we could always have all of the conversations about. Like, like some people just lie to themselves, you know, it's like, it's true that, you know, I, I'm just not afraid for my son's life. I mean, he goes to a great school here in Connecticut. I have a great group of friends. I'm not concerned about him when he goes out in the street. I'm not concerned about him having an interaction with the police that ends in death. I get it. But I wrote a book called When Thinking About Tamir Rice While Driving My Sons to School. Because sometimes the symbolism of the moment has more power than whatever the statistical analysis would suggest. But the, the real point is not to try to argue from either one of those modes, but to think through what it would mean to have to arrive at a different place. And, um, you know, sometimes I feel like the best thing for me to do is find ways to opt out of the public conversation about some of these things yeah. and opt into the rigorous thinking that's necessary for me to try to write my way into something more than articulating a problem, right? Because I do think like, that's how a question of freedom, I mean, it's in the title, you know? That's kind of how it was cheap, you know? But it was cheap in the sense that like, I just cop to, I'm gonna explore what it meant to be in prison. I'm not gonna explore what it meant to be guilty. And what blew, what, what like changed so much about how I think about this is when I came home, and I found out, and I started thinking about all of the women that I know who have been raped and then have been in the courtroom working with the prosecutor. And they, you know, they don't want restorative justice. They want the other kind of justice. They want culpability. They want whatever, right? They want accountability. They want time. Or, you know, first year of law school, I'm driving home with my family because my best friend, nephew, gets murdered. You know, like, like, there is no easy conversation around this that just says mass incarceration is the reason. 
You know, I got four people out of prison this year. One guy had two homicides. You know, another guy um, had a robbery. Like, like this is like the actual violence, you know, and, and I go to the parole board and, and we're making cases for people who should be free despite what they did because the case is built on mercy. You know, the case isn't built on the the way in which racism is an integral part of so many decisions that happen in the justice system. I don't know. I think um, it's, it's just so interesting how the public conversation differs so dramatically from the conversation that you ever have to have with another human being about something that you did to them or about something that somebody you know did to them. You know, it's just like, it's frightening how different the public conversation is from what I have to say to a parole board, from what I had to say when I was a public defender to the family members of like somebody that my client might have robbed. I just, you know, I just couldn't imagine. I mean, I, a woman once said to me, you know, said to our investigator, I get that they locked too many of our black brothers up. I get it. I get it. But this kid pulled a gun out on me and he should be in prison. Kid was 15 years old, pulled a BB gun out on her. I was like, you know, it was a BB gun. She was like, he should be in prison. You know, and like, we missing something. Whatever needs to be said to reach her, it's not there. And whatever needs to be said to reach me when like my folks have been victimized, like it's not there. And uh, I don't know. People say, Dwayne, how much time do you think you should have did? I don't like, you know, I guess five. You know, I guess some like some review. You know, I guess like, I, I don't know, you know. I don't know. Not an answerable question, really. Not a not the right question. There's a tension between personal responsibility and social forces. And at the extreme, we all have perfect choice and free will to do whatever we want. We make our choices and live with the consequences. At the other extreme, we have no freedom because the way we were raised, the way we were, where we grew up, the incentives around us, the education we didn't get. And of course, in reality, it's, it's not one of those two extremes. It's both. And, and yeah. we don't like that. And so the public conversation, what you're saying that resonates with me so deeply is that, and having just finished your book, is that, because you have both in there. Your book is not a, it's not self-justifying. It's an honest ex- assessment of what you did. And, and like you said just now, uh, but it's pretty clear that there's some hard things going on there that are nobody's fault. And so for me, you know, as a as listeners know, everything's complicated. And what what I hear from you in that really uh, eloquent summary is that it's complicated, and our public conversation is it's simplistic to the point of dangerous because it's either one or the other, and you got to win. You got to win right. for your side, and that's not going to help people's lives. I don't think. I don't. It scares me. Both sides. Both sides scare me a lot. No, I agree, you know, but again, I, I think we talk about books. I think the, the beautiful part about it is, and this is why I try to land on is that um, those extremes don't get remembered. And I, and I just think that we live in a contemporary moment where you, you get far more airtime for living along the bandwidth of either extreme. And we've all forgotten that the extremes don't get remembered. I mean, and the truth is like, in terms of literature, in terms of like producing something like fine, most everything don't get doesn't get remembered. But but like a lot of folks used to pursue something beyond the extremes. Yeah. You know, it's like you can't read James Baldwin and think he was pursuing the extreme. I mean, he literally has a passage about throwing a coffee a coffee mug at a waitress's head. Like that doesn't exist in a contemporary moment where you write with that kind of self-reflection, will you own the way that whatever this disease is that we argue affects the country, like affects us as speaker, you know? So. Let's, um, let's close and talk a little bit about poetry. Um, poetry for most, or a lot of Americans, I think a lot of people generally is quote hard, you know, their, their attitude. I think, I think a lot of people may be listening to this, Say, well, yeah, I don't do poetry because um, 
I don't, or I don't get poetry. A little bit like, you could say it's a little bit like jazz. Jazz and poetry obviously have something in common. You know, people say I don't get jazz or I don't get classical music. Um, most people don't say I don't get uh, heavy metal. They might not like it, but right. they get it. Uh, the whole idea of poetry, I think, is this paradoxical as it is with jazz or great music generally, is by picking a style that is not straightforward, you get somewhere you couldn't otherwise get. True, right? true. Which is, which is hard to understand until you've delved into it. Uh, talk about the, you mentioned earlier, the, the poetry anthology and your desire to be a poet. How, when did, you know, how did that spark work to make you want to write poetry as opposed to just read it? I think it was because, that's why I say after it's night too. You know, everybody else made me want to read poetry. But Knight made me want to write poetry because I've recognized him mine. He was trying to find meaning and understanding and what it meant to be incarcerated. So like he'll have a poem where he's talking about the faces that he looks at on the wall of his family members. And he's telling his story about how, you know, he was trying to overcome addiction and how he almost did it. But he didn't. And he ended up breaking in somebody's crib and, and ended up in prison. And, you know, it, it was it was like real. And and it was a kind of, I don't know if the poem was about him, but the speaker in that poem, how he was telling that story was 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 evidence of a kind of self-awareness of the conditions of confinement that I just hadn't seen anywhere. You know, it was the first time that I read something that it wasn't an argument. You know, it was something else. It was something that was crystalline that that you could get through those lines. And um and so that's what made me want to be a poet because it made me feel like – and I got all of this in 30, 40 lines though. You know, it wasn't a dissertation. And, yeah. and so, you know, it was like – just. and then I read a poem I actually called for Freckle Face Gerald. And it was about a 16-year-old kid that got raped in prison. And I was in prison and I was a teenager and I got in at 16. And Knight wrote this poem in the 60s, early 70s, which meant that like I thought I was the one. Like I thought that um, I was a part of the first cohort that had been treated this way by the country, right? And I read that poem. I was like, wait, this has been happening? And, and, and one, the poem made me like be sort of less – you know, I was obsessed with my own suffering, right? And I was like, damn, man, it could, it could be worse. <laughs> I could be this kid. And I had all – you know, the kid said um, for Freckle Face who couldn't win – the trust of fists of the other cats with his precise talk and innocent grin. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm, I'm like, I make jokes, I laugh, you know, I'm smart, but I, I came up where I came up and I like fully fit in everywhere I go. Right. And that's just like, a, and I don't even say that to brag, it's just like, you know, you got qualities that you recognize about yourself. And I sort of recognize that that has like always been a kind of thing about me, but it wasn't for Gerald, you know? And, um, and, and so anyway, I read that, and that's why I wanted to do it, because I, he made me recognize that poetry could be history, it could be music, but it could be a real exploration of what it means to be alive at a particular moment. And it could be all of those things in a span of 10, 15, 20 well-written lines. You know, and so in terms of like the, the way that a novel would intimidate a person, me specifically, the poem didn't do it. You know, the poem felt felt like I I could do this thing, you know, and that's why I started writing. And and from that moment, you know, I read that book and I said, I am going to be a poet. And so I had did this two years already where I was just like, I'm going to be a writer. And I had just said it and started doing these things and writing essays. But but I wasn't really like I'm going to be a novelist or anything like that. It was sort of just a, a general aspiration that was floating in the ether, right, that was defining my relationship to books, but not really my relationship to output. To, to work. To a, right. Yeah. But then I said, I'm going to be a poet. I mean, now I'm stapling pages together. You know, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, yo, you want to hear this poem I wrote? And I'm reading poems to the people that's in the cells beside me. And, and I'm taking models now, you know, now I'm reading as a writer. I'm like, oh, I like that. Let me try to write a poem that's in the vein of this thing that Sonia Sanchez did. And, and so it's, you know, it was, it was freeing though, actually. And, and, and I still think that's the case. Although I feel like the challenge with poetry is like, if you say, let me hear something. So many poets got to go to that book. And so now my challenge as a, as a poet is like, nah, if you ask me for something, it needs to be in my head. And so what does it mean to begin to learn my work by heart and, and carry it around with me? And mm -hmm. I think that um, 
you know, most contemporary poets. I mean, it's just not, I, I got an MFA. It wasn't a part of the practice. It was never a time during my MFA where somebody said, uh, yes, and Dwayne, as a poet, you need to carry 10 poems around in your head by yourself and at least three by others. This is like your duty. You know, it's almost like imagine somebody was a preacher and they was like, well, yeah, so I wanted to talk about the Bible, which passed. I've been, hold up, hold up. Let me go get my Bible because I know it's something in John that will be important for this conversation. <laughs> it's like, nah, that's not that's not what you think a pastor should do. And, um, and so I think <laughs> I imagine like the training of a poet should be more akin to that. It should be like, no, you you need to know your work. But you need to know the work of others because when it's time to minister, and it's just talking about it in religious terms, extending the metaphor to the point of absurdity. But it's true. You know, when you want to expose or introduce somebody to your work, you, you can't have to go to the book. At least that's how I'm feeling about it now. And so I'm working really hard to, like, know things. And it's very Homeric, I think. You know, I think Homer was just uh, – I, I don't think he did a lot of readings from his uh, – from the parchment. I have a feeling right. he was – but I don't know, maybe not. They're pretty long. Um, that's um, that's intense. Um, that that whole idea. Um, you write in your book in a question of, of freedom. You write about submitting poem after poem after poem as a prisoner. I've submitted a few poems for publication in my life, but they've most of them have been rejected. Maybe all of them. I have to think about whether it's literally every single one, but. Um, you get rejection after rejection, which is common for a beginner and even an, sometimes an experienced poet. And then you get a poem accepted. You're a prisoner. And you talk about the elation that you felt. And I, I just, you know, I found that part so poignant because you want to share it. Uh, and the people around you maybe don't fully share your enthusiasm for the enterprise or for yourself. <laughs> so talk about what that was like. But it's probably because I'm telling you, it's probably because I didn't know the stuff by heart. People rapped and shared raps all the time. They knew them by heart. People freestyled all the time. And they, oh, they shared in my excitement because I was running around the block like, yo, I got this straight published. It's like, they was like, you got a book published? Nah, not a book. Well, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, what is it? You get paid, nah, you get paid, you know. But uh, it's wild, though, because that first poem, it was um, a different route. And it was about a father who had two sons. And he was went back to his old neighborhood. And it's like searching for the thing in the eyes of the children there that my wife and my sons say have turned to stone in my own. And, you know, I wrote this as like a 20-year-old, you know, no girlfriend, let alone a wife and two sons. But I think... You know, your obsessions are your obsessions. And, and maybe one of mine is this, this this understanding that prison could break you. And it could break you in ways that you think nobody else notices, but people see it in your eyes. And and the poem was a, about regretting that. And even though the poem doesn't mention prison at all, you know, um, it's wild that I, I wrote that, really, because... But that's the thing, you know, was Knight writing about himself or was he writing about he under, how he understood the world? And if you read that poem now, you, you might think that I wrote it this year. Yeah. Because you think, oh, well, Dwayne has two sons. I mean, yeah. it, you know, it has to be about him. But no, I mean, I wrote that decades ago. You know, so. And if I would have been able to say it to folks, though, the men around me who had children, if I would have been able to, like, embody it in a way that I try to embody work publicly now, you know, I, I can't help but to believe that they would have been like, Yo, write me one of those. You know, I'd be I mean, like, like, let me send that to my folks. Because cause they did respond that way sometimes. But um, at the time, I thought writing was a private occupation. You know, I, I didn't understand, as Etheridge Knight would say, that you publish a poem when you read it aloud. You know, I, I didn't understand that then. So, yeah. So let's close with one of your poems. Um, you could, it won't bother me if you read it out of the book. Uh, I have a copy of Felon. Uh, I, I, right feel, like I, I uh, feel like I set the bar up, so I'm going to try to, uh, I'm going to read something from heart. You, okay. Okay. Uh, you know, people who are listening at home, 
uh, through a podcast will not know whether you're reading it by heart or not, but certainly those on YouTube or on YouTube, because you could be reading it off I'm, screen, Dwayne, but I'm give it a shot. To, I'm trying to be lovely, though. Oh, you're you know. sweet. You're so sweet. <laughs> you're a good man. Uh, blood history. Adam Smith reference there for people, but go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, um, blood history. The things that abandon you get remembered different. As precise as the English language can be, with words like penultimate and perseverate, there is not an exact combination of sounds that describe only that leaving. Once, drinking and smoking with buddies, a friend asked if I longed for a father. Had he said wanted, I would have dismissed him in a way the youngins dismiss it all. A shrug, sarcasm, a sharp jab to the stomach. But he said longing. And in a different place, I might have wept. Said once my father lived with us and then he didn't. And it fucked me up so bad that I didn't think about his leaving until I held my first son in my arms and only now speak on it. A man who drank whiskey and wild Irish rose like water once told me and some friends that there is no word for father where he comes from. Not like we know it. There, the word father is the same as the word for listen. The blunts we passed around let us abandon our tongues. Not that much, though. But what if the old head knew something? And if you have no father, you can't hear straight. Years later, the same friend that asked me about longing wondered why I didn't name my son after my own father. As if he ain't know. Some things turn your life into a prayer. The gods will certainly, certainly answer. My guest today has been Dwayne Betts. Dwayne, thanks so much for being part of Econ Talk. Yeah, no, it was a it was a pleasure, man. Thanks for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.